Welcome to our English worship this morning. Time flies. Another year is coming to an end. A year came, and a year is passing away. And before you know, you too will be passing away. You and I will surely pass away because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, and after death comes judgment. Have you given thoughts to these ultimate questions? Don't just celebrate New Year. Think about the fact that you are closer to death every time you celebrate a New Year's. Have you given thoughts to those ultimate questions? Why would we die, and where are we going after death? I guess that's why we have this series. That's why we want to talk about the ultimate questions and answer with you. And we have come to the final two sermons in this series now. Sermon number nine today. The question is. How do I go through the eye of a needle? And part of the answer is contained in Jesus and the rich ruler. The story for today. Do you still remember what Daisy read to us? That heart-wrenching saying of Jesus. How difficult it is for those who have wealth. Oh, that probably includes every one of us here to enter the kingdom of God. How difficult it is. For those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, for it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person like us to enter the kingdom of God. How do I go through the eye of a needle? Like I said before, today's story will only give part of the answer. So what we're doing today is part one is somewhat dark and negative. It is warning from Jesus. Then next week when we return, we'll have part two. Part two is a bright and positive story, illustrating the transforming power of God through Jesus Christ. We ask, how do I go through the eye of a needle? And the answer. Is Jesus must come into our life and rule our house? What magic did Jesus possess? What magic would Jesus bring to sinful human being? Some people say, "Well, Jesus' magic is to make the eye of the needle, the gates of heaven, so big, so big that even a great sinner like me, you know, who have trouble." Uh, reading the Bible, who have troubles giving us wealth, who have trouble being self-righteous, even a big sinner like me can walk through it. Jesus make the gates of heaven so grace, and that's called grace because it's not by works; it's by grace through faith. Unfortunately, what people are saying. Is anything but cheap grace. It's cheap grace. It's the kind of grace people dream up, because they don't want to change. They don't want to repent. They don't really want to follow Jesus. So they dream of Jesus making heaven so the door so wide that anybody can walk through it. But true grace is nothing like that. True grace, rather, is Jesus' magic to shrink. The camel, Jesus' magic to take away all our self righteousness and our love for this world. Jesus' magic to transform us from camel into tiny little ants, so that repentant sinners, transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ, can now enter through Jesus' narrow door. Remember, Jesus said that the door to heaven, to the kingdom of God, is narrow. He's not going to make it big for you, but he's going to make you small, so small that you can walk into it. Now, in order to get to that story, that bright and glorious road, we must first walk through 
the valley of the shadow of death. And that is the story for today. We begin with we begin with Luke chapter 18, verse 18. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? A ruler asked him. Now this man is neither a nobleman nor a government official. That's not the kind of ruler he is talking about here. Rather, this ruler is a ruler of a Jewish synagogue. He's a religious leader. He's a leader of very high social standing. Now, what do you think about a man like that? Who walk into your church, who walk up to Jesus to ask a question like that? Interestingly, when if you have been reading the Gospel of Luke, you will not be too optimistic about this guy. Why? Because some of us remember some of these religious folks that have come to Jesus. You know, even in our Ultimate Question and Answer series, we have met a few of them. In sermon number two, Jesus and the sinful woman, Jesus was at a party hosted by a Pharisee. And it ended up that the sinful woman was the one who will be praised by Jesus, but the, the, the Pharisee was singled out as someone who had no true faith. Then in sermon three, Jesus and the volunteer disciples, the first disciple that walked up to Jesus and said to Jesus, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Remember that? That guy was a scribe, another religious leader. And then in sermon number four, Jesus and the legal expert, a lawyer came to Jesus and put him to the test. That too was a religious leader. He was a lawyer of the law of God. So all these religious leaders, they clash with Jesus and eventually fade away. Now you have another religious leader. That doesn't look good. But more than that, if you keep reading about the story, you will realize that not only was this guy religious, he was also extremely, extremely wealthy. He was a rare breed. He was a giant among men. He has been double jab with heavenly vaccine. So if you were Jews and you think about a guy like that, he was religious and he was also very rich. You think very highly of him. First of all, he was righteous, as righteous as a man can be before the law of God. He is a ruler. He is a leader of the synagogue. Secondly, the favor of God is obviously upon him. That's why he's so rich. If God's favor is upon you, you've got to be rich. So this guy was both righteous and God's favor is upon him. All this look great until you realize that Jesus has made some very surprising comments about rich people. Remember our sermon number five, Jesus and the rich fool. Jesus used a parable to describe people who are greedy for money. He, Jesus called them fool. And remember sermon number eight, Jesus and the beggar outside. Jesus gave another parable, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You would have expected the rich man to enter the kingdom of God and Lazarus went to hell. But the reverse happened. So Jesus makes some very interesting comments about rich person. As it turned out, this man received not double jab vaccine, but double jab poison. The first poison jab he received is self-righteousness because he was so good before the law of God, making him unable to seek salvation in Christ and righteousness of God. The second poisonous jab he received is love of money, making him unable to seek treasure in heaven, unable to seek the kingdom of God. This man's life was in great danger. Does it sound like you? But thankfully, he has come to the right person. Jesus is the only person who can save a man like that. Double jack, poison. So he came to Jesus and he said, good teacher. This is a very noble title. This guy called upon Jesus because he had high regard for Jesus. He came to seek Jesus on advice, advice on attaining righteousness. 
despite his high standing, despite his achievement, that something is lacking in him. So he came to the good teacher and seek advice on attaining righteousness. Then he asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That wasn't another question more ultimate than this, right? I've never had people walk up to my office and say, Pastor Lam, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'm willing to trade five years of my life for that question. Somebody come and ask that question. And yet this guy had come to Jesus seeking advice on how to enter into the kingdom of God. What a promising young man. What did Jesus say in in reply to such a good student, to such a good question? Verse 19, surprise. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So we thought he was a good student. As it turned out, his first address of Jesus was already full of problem, a very problematic. Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. No one is good except God alone. Now, if you're familiar with Genesis, you will know what Jesus was saying. In Genesis 1, when God created the world, the entire world in six days, right? After the first day, God saw what he had did, and it was good. After the second day, and God saw what he had done, it was good, 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 good. Until the sixth day, God had created man and put man in the middle of this entire creation, and God saw everything. Behold, it was very good. Good is the adjective of God. Good means God. He is a good God. He is a very good God. And so Jesus said, why do you call me good? Because no one is good except God alone. Now Jesus' response can be understood in two ways. The first way is this. Hey, be careful with what you said. I'm, I'm just a teacher. I'm just a teacher. I'm not God, so don't call me good. That's one way to read it. The other way to read it is, do you really know who I am? Why do you call me good but call me teacher also? Do you know that my true identity is not a good teacher, but the one and only good God? You see, Jesus was hinting to him that he had misunderstood his identity. He thought Jesus to be a good teacher. And Jesus said, I'm much more than a good teacher. I am the good God. I came from heaven and not from earth. But you have no understanding of who I am. Now, perhaps this ruler has not done enough research on Jesus. Now, that's kind of like a lot of people. They, they, they heard about Jesus and they came to church. And Pastor Lam, uh, you know, I, uh, somebody introduced me to you because I'm someone who is sick at home. Can you pray for him? I heard Jesus can do that kind of miracle. That guy obviously had not done his research. He had not read his Bible. He just heard people, what people said about Jesus. And then he came. On that saying, he has not listened to Jesus' teaching. And when you have not listened to Jesus' teaching, you think of him as the good teacher. And perhaps this, um, this man's eyes were so bad, he could not see who Jesus truly is. Jesus is the only true God, the good Savior and King. Now you've got, yeah, one, if, 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 and if only he would see Jesus and follow Jesus, then he will receive eternal life because right, right there, standing in front of him is the good God. But on the other hand, if he, he, he failed to see who Jesus truly is and he persisted in his rebellion and self-righteousness and love for money, this man obviously is in great trouble. He will be judged and condemned by the good and holy God. So here's the ultimate question for all of us here. Do we really know who Jesus is? Do we know him not just as a good teacher, but a good God? Listen carefully to what 
Jesus has been teaching. You know, I challenge you, I encourage you to go through the four gospel and listen to Jesus' teaching for yourself. Do not be like some ignorant people out there who will say something like, you know, I, I truly admire Jesus' teaching and life. Have you heard something like that? He's a good teacher. He's a very good moral teacher. And I honestly believe he lived a great life. He used his life to teach us how to love one another. I admire Jesus' life and teaching. No, Jesus' teaching were not meant to be admired. Jesus' teaching were meant to be obeyed. You see, that's the difference. The good teacher teaching was meant to be admired. The good God's teaching was meant to be obeyed. And Jesus' teaching is there to call us to repentance, to a life of full submission, to follow him all the days of our life. Now, this, this guy has no understanding who Jesus is. What did Jesus say? Well, here's Jesus' response. Luke chapter 18, verse 20. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Jesus threw out the Ten Commandments. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, commandment number seven. Do not murder, number six. Do not steal, number eight. Do not bear false witness, number nine. And then back to number five, honor your father and your mother. So there are a couple of things we do not know. We do not know whether Jesus intend to cover the entire Decalogue, you understand? He has given us a sample of it, but he's kind of doing it in some interesting order. Could it be that he was in the process of going through the entire Ten Commandments, but he got interrupted by this guy? Because you know that the guy will interrupt him right there. Maybe Jesus really wants to give us the whole Ten Commandments. The second thing we don't know is that after he has given us the Ten Commandments, will he begin to explain to us God's true intention about the Ten Commandments? Namely, that God is not just looking at your external behavior, but he is looking at what is inside of you. You have heard people say, do not murder, but I tell you, if you hate a brother in your heart, you have already committed murder. You have heard that, do not commit adultery. But if you have looked at a woman with lust, you already have committed adultery. Your judgment is sure. We don't know. He never got a chance to do that. But we know one thing. Jesus is citing the commandment not to condemn the young rich ruler, but to help him to see his spiritual need. Jesus gave him the law. And what is the primary function of the law? The primary function of the law is to convict us of our sin. Romans chapter 3, Paul writes this. Now we know that whatever is in the law, say it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and whole world may be held accountable to God. The law of God tells us that we are guilty, we are sinful, and we will receive God's righteous judgment unless we repent and be saved by God. For the works of the Lord, no, by the works of the Lord, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So here is what you are going to find in the law. What you find in the law is an infinitely holy God against an infinitely Simple man. The law of God is like a perfect, unblemished mirror, exposing all our sins and filthiness. So if you can even calm down yourself and look at yourself through the mirror, you will see, oh my God, I am dirty and filthy. It is for those who are standing behind before the law to see that they are sinful. I like this insightful quote from G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton said this, Original sin is the only doctrine that has been empirical, empirically validated by 2,000 years of human history. The Christian talk about original sins. The Christian talk about many interesting doctrines, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of God, the Holy Spirit. But there was one thing 
that even a non-Christian will be able to verify that. And it is the doctrine of sin. We know that. We know that this world is full of sin, not because of whatever happened internationally or whatever happened nationally or in our society, the poverty rate and all that. We know that sin is real because we know ourselves. If you will spend five minutes each day thinking about what has gone through your mind and your deeds, it will be hard to convince ourselves that we are right before the law. We are all sinful. And we should know that. Now, how did the ruler respond to Jesus' challenge? Jesus showed him the law. And his response was both shocking and very sad. All these I have kept since I was young. Young meaning probably the age of 13, because that was when a Jewish boy came of age. That's when the Jewish boy became a man, and he will take responsibility to uphold the law of God. And the guy said, ever since that time, guess what? Perfect. Perfect. I'm sorry to say that, but I, seriously, all my teachers say, I'm, I'm perfect. You look at my great report, you want my transcript. It's, it, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't mean to be rude or boastful or prideful, but yes, my transcripts say a uh, hundred points. All these I have kept since from my youth. He was full of confidence. Why? Because he did not know Jesus. He thinks that Jesus is just another earthly teacher. And since my early teacher gave me 100%, I'm going to score 100%. He had no understanding that he's standing right before a divine judge. One who has no sin, one who is perfect in every way, and one who hates sin. So this rich ruler, he had bad eyesight. He could not recognize Jesus. But now more than that, he put on sunglasses to block out the light of the glory of the law of God. You see, the law of God shined the light upon you to convict you of sin. But what did he do? Well, he had bad eyesight already. Now he put on sunglasses. That makes him self-righteous. That's the only way you can become self-righteous in this world, you know, by blocking out the light of the glory of the law of God. And then you said, I'm quite a good person. And there are many ways to do it. Turn on your TV. You're a good person. You're a good person. Go to a bookstore, find some books, read about psychology, read about anthropology, sociology. You are a good man. What's the problem? The problem is not with you, it's with this world, and we're going to fix it. We're going to improve it. We're going to evolve to become better humanity and all these things. It is not within, it's without. You can put on your sunglasses and dream about the kind of nice people you are. Sometimes I fear that for ourselves because when you go to school and you go to work, nobody is going to tell you that you are a sinner. You are a sinner before a holy God. Nobody will even tell you there is a God, there is a holy God, and there will be judgment. You are going to die. You have bad eyesight. You are wearing sunglasses to block out the light of the law of God. So this guy is in trouble. Bad eyesight, sunglasses. If I were Jesus, I would have given up. But Jesus is the good teacher. The good teacher persisted. Well, actually, more than that, he was a good God, and the good God pressed on to try saving this lost soul. Verse 19, Luke chapter 18, verse 19. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you lack. If you read another version from another gospel, Jesus looked at him and what? Love him. He was not, Jesus was not mad. I would be mad. But Jesus was not mad. He loved him. And so he tell him the truth. One thing you learn. Now, this must be re intriguing for this ruler because he has come to Jesus because he knows he's lacking something, right? But why, why, if he's perfect, why would he come to Jesus? It's sometimes it's like that. Your teacher gives you a hundred points. You know that you are not that good. You know that your teacher just kind of curve it. 
That's why you got 100 points. But you are missing something. There was something that made him suspect that he, there's something wrong with him. So he came to Jesus asking for that one thing, and Jesus said, one thing you lack. And that totally intrigued him. So you can imagine him being drawn to Jesus. Tell me, please tell me. Tell me. What is that one thing I lack so I could be perfect, so that I can enter into eternal life? Tell me the thing that is missing. So what is missing? Now we all know the answer. The answer is always Jesus. Jesus is always the missing piece. Especially if all you want is eternal life. Guess what? What you need, what you need is Jesus. The thing that he lacks is come and follow me. Come and follow me, Jesus. We'll give him eternal life. Now let me say this. What he lacks was not a sinner's prayer. Sometimes people will say that. Have you prayed a sinner's prayer? It's very easy. You want eternal life. Wait, right here, right here. Even you are not ready to commit to Jesus. It's okay. Let's just pray the sinner's prayer and you're done. And another time people will say, oh, you prayed the sinner's prayer many years ago, but what about baptism? Have you considered baptism? You don't have to be a perfect Christian. You don't have to do, be, do this. But if you will be baptized and you will have eternal life. Jesus' answer is not baptism. Jesus' answer is not the sinner's prayer. Jesus' answer is one thing you lack is the act of following him. The act of following him. Not for a moment in life. You know, people, when they came to church and joined the church for baptism, they join, they follow Jesus for a moment in life. And then two weeks later, we don't even know where they are. We couldn't find them. Not for a moment in life, but for a lifetime. That's what Jesus meant. How do you gain eternal life? Follow Jesus. Not for a moment in life, but for a lifetime. You will have eternal life. However, for this guy, in order to get to following Jesus, there are some obstacles to overcome. What are the obstacles for him? Take that. Sell all that you have. Distribute to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Until this point, Luke has not told us anything about this man's bank account. We have no idea whether he's rich or poor until now. Then it suddenly appeared that this guy seems to have some substantial wealth. Did Jesus look at him, look at the brand names on his attire that Jesus reasoned that he is very rich? Or Jesus simply possessed supernatural knowledge of everything. He knows exactly what this guy's problem is. So Jesus saw through his wealth, dived deep into his heart, and discovered within his heart a deadly tumor. He has a tumor in his heart, you know that block him from eternal life. That tumor will send him to eternal death. Jesus knows that. He has to remove that tumor. It is not Jesus pointing a gun at him and saying, your life or your money. It's Jesus pointing this surgical knife at him and say, your life or this tumor. You have to remove this tumor. And Jesus said, so, your possession, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Oh my God, this guy has been storing treasure on earth, not in heaven. It's very interesting because he, he openly proclaimed to the crowd and to Jesus, he has come for eternal life. That was the only one thing he desired in his life, right? One thing he desired. What do you desire? Well, he was like, my desire, my, my greater desire in life is eternal life. Somehow, well, he said, I desire eternal life. He was storing up treasure, not in heaven, but on earth. If you desire eternal life, where should you be storing your, up your treasure? You should be in heaven, right? No, he didn't do that. He did it on earth. That guy was a hypocrite. That's why he knows something is missing. Because despite his open proclamation, say, I really want to go to heaven. He was storing up everything on earth. You see that inconsistency? The hypocrisy, saying one thing but doing exactly the opposite. And he came to Jesus being rich and not feeling alarmed because he had missed out on all Jesus' teaching about wealth and money. 
Maybe he doesn't have the internet. He just heard Jesus is a really nice guy, a wise teacher and all that. He forgot to read the Gospel of Luke because if he had been reading the Gospel of Luke, he would know that Jesus always warned people about wealth, money, and possession. So he missed all that. It's all right. Jesus went to work right there. Jesus gave him a personalized crash course on money and possession. You never got a chance to hear my teaching, right? It's all right. Let me give you one line. Sell all you have. Give it to the poor. Now, the fuller version appears in Luke chapter 12. Let me read to you. This is the fuller version of Jesus' teaching. Jesus said this, Fear not, little flock. Little flock means little sheep, sheep of God. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You want the kingdom. The Father is happy to give you the kingdom and eternal life. Now, do this. Sell your possession. Give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be. That's the fuller teaching. There are two things I want you to notice. The first is there is a close and direct relationship between treasure and kingdom. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Jesus is showing the ruler the way into God's kingdom. How? Store up treasure in heaven, and then you will be in heaven. Store up treasure inside God's kingdom, not on earth, and you will be in God's kingdom. Where your money is, where your heart will be. There is a close and direct relationship between where you store your treasure and whether you will be in the kingdom of God. It's that simple. That's point number one. Point number two, more complicated one. More than one, Jesus had taught about selling possessions. More than one, Jesus had talked about giving to the needy or the poor. What does that mean? What does it mean for us? Right? Let me ask this question. Who were the poor? Now, some of you are saying, come on, Pastor Lamb. Isn't that straightforward? You're evading the question. You're like the hypocrite lawyer that said, who is my neighbor? Because you don't really want to love your neighbor. You don't want to give it to the poor, right? That's why you say, who were the poor? No, I tell you, this is not a trivial question. Who were the poor? To us, the poor means you turn on the TV, Hong Kong government tells you our poverty line has been at this level, and how many percent of our population are considered poor, and so there is an increased number of poor people in society. So what do you do? Sell your possession, give to the poor. That's a literal application and understanding, and usually is not quite correct. Who were the poor? Well, first, in this context, in the context of this discussion, we're talking about poor Jewish people, the poor within the covenant of God, the God of Israel, Yahweh. All right, that's one. The second, as we move further away from the Old Testament into the New Testament, the poor are the poor within the church. We're no longer thinking about just poor people in Causeway Bay, Sam Sui Bo, Kun Tong, Shang Sui, whatever you can think of. Is we're not talking about those poor people. We're talking about the poor people within the church. How do I know? How do I know? Now this book is the Gospel of Luke. Luke wrote two books, part one and part two, combined. The first book is called the Gospel of Luke. The second book is called the Acts of the Apostles. Luke is big on the poor. Luke is big on selling possession, right? So when Jesus' teaching is sell your possession, give to the poor, you would have expected some kind of story later on in Acts of the Apostles talking about selling possession and give to the poor, right? You definitely will be thinking about that. But what story do you get? Let me read you a few verses from the Acts of the Apostle. Acts of the Apostle, chapter 2, early church, verse 44. And all who believe were gathered together, have all things in common. And they were selling their possessions, selling the possession, keyword, and belonging, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. The all doesn't mean people of this world. The all means the needy within the church. Chapter 4, Acts of the Apostle, verse 34. There were not a needy person among them, among them in the church. 
For as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceed of what was sold and lay it at the apostles' feet, not at the government's feet or NGO's feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. One more individual example. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostle Barnabas, Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levi. Listen to that. A religious leader, a Levi, a native of Cyrus, sold a few that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we begin to understand that the selling the possession and give it to the poor. The poor doesn't mean the poor in our society as per se, but rather the poor within the church. The money goes to the church. Now, I'm not asking you to sell your possession and give it to CCC. Please don't do that. There are many reasons why you shouldn't do that. But what I'm saying is that God is calling us to use all our possession and resources at His disposal, at the disposal of the church of God, the body of Christ. This is not a call for philanthropy. You understand what I mean? Jesus is not calling you to give your money for the betterment of mankind. Not that kind of ideology. He's talking about use all your possession and your resources for the kingdom of God, for the preaching of the gospel, for the gospel community, so that they may give the testimony of his grace to the Entire, entire world. So there was a legend in the early church. What is the legend? The legend is that this young rich ruler who walked away sadly, right? He will eventually come back. Who is he? He is Barnabas. He's Barnabas. He is a religious leader. That was, I mean, it's a, it's a legend. It's, I can't say it's the, that story is real, but it makes sense. That was a religious leader by the name of Barnabas. He had encountered Jesus. He walked away sadly because he had great wealth. But then he came back. He sold his field, laid it upon the feet of the apostle, and he used the rest of his life, not just his money, for the gospel. You know, I, was, I just did a search on the name Barnabas. The name Barnabas appeared almost 30 times in the New Testament. 30 times! I don't think there's any other name other than Peter, Paul, John that appear more than 30 times, more, more than Barnabas in the New Testament. Barnabas is not just a giver. He gave his life, not just his wealth for the kingdom. He gave his life for the gospel ministry. And that's what Jesus is calling this rich ruler to do, not a life of philanthropy but a life of repentance, a life of storing up treasures in heaven, a life of devotion to Jesus Christ and the body of Christ on earth. And Jesus said, that is eternal life. So how did this young rich ruler respond to Jesus' call to follow him? But when he heard these things, he became very sad, at least on that day, for he was extremely rich. Now, being rich is just a symptom. His real sickness was he was blind. And he walked away, he became very sad, for he was very blind. He was in profound spiritual darkness. He could not see the reality, the glory of heaven. So all he knows is storing up treasures on earth. His spiritual Darkness, his spiritual blindness make him self-righteous, unable to see the holiness of God and his own sinfulness. And his spiritual blindness make him a lover of money. Now sometimes when we think about people, we say, oh yeah, that guy is a lover of money, man. That guy loved the world. That guy cannot get rid of money and fame and all that. That is the symptom. The real sickness is the man is blind. He could not see there is another world beyond this world. He cannot see that there are treasures right there. No one can take away. So all he is thinking about, I can only store up treasure here. Because you cannot see another world. Once you have opened your eye to another world and know that there are treasures there that will never fade away while the treasure is here, 
will all fade away. Where will you store your treasure? You will store your treasure there and here. The man is blind. He could not see the other side. So he keeps storing up this, the other world bank, bank of hell. So he store up this trash paper and think that they are of great wealth, not knowing that he could convert all these trash paper into lasting wealth in another world. He's blind, he could not see the other world. He can only see this world. So he store up treasure here, but not there. He can see beyond. But this guy, let me tell you, is not beyond salvation. Why? Because look at him, he walked away sadly. He became very sad. He did not dismiss Jesus and proudly walk away. If Jesus, if somebody come to me and say, what must I do in her eternal life? And Pastor Lamb say, why don't you sell your possession, give to the church, and then come and work in the church? The guy will probably look at me funny and think stupid and walk away. That guy did not walk away, say stupid. That guy did not walk away and just dismiss Jesus, crazy teacher, heretic. He walked away sadly. That means he knew Jesus was right. Jesus hit him at that spot that he couldn't go. He knew he shouldn't be storing up treasure on there, but he did. Why? Because he couldn't see another world. So he knew that something wrong with his own righteousness. His own righteousness would not be able to save him. But now he couldn't let go of his money. This guy had come all the way to Jesus to seek eternal life. And now eternal life is right before him because Jesus is right before him. Eternal life was so close yet so far away. How ironic it is. You come and say, what do you want? I want eternal life. Eternal life right in front of you. So close, but so far away. So he walked away sadly. Jesus is not done. Seeing that he had become very sad, Jesus said to the crowd, how difficult that heart-wrenching saying of Jesus and warning. And I want everybody to take it to their heart. Don't think you are saved because you have been in church. Don't think that, well, you know, I've been baptized. I've been coming to church. Okay, you know, my attendance is all right. You know, I read my Bible from time to time. It's all right. No, take it to your heart. How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus is talking about you, not someone out there. He's talking about you, for it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich person, that is you, to enter the kingdom of God. A camel through the eye of a needle is a speech of contrast, the largest and the smallest. Camel turned out to be the largest among common animals in Palestine at that time. So what you can see day to day, the biggest animal you can imagine, you can see is camel. An eye of a needle was the smallest opening one will encounter in the daily life. So Jesus made that big contrast. Is that difficult? That take us to chapter 18, verse 26 and 27. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? What is impossible with man is possible with God. So the crowd were astonished. They said, if the double jab vaccinated ruler could not be safe, could not enter, who else could make it into the kingdom of God? Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What does he mean by that? Like I said, I already told you, what Jesus meant is he will be able to string the camel. He is able to transform the camel into a tiny ant so that the ant can walk through the narrow door into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is able to turn true repentance in us, no matter how self-righteous they are, no matter how big, how, how, how much money they have. Jesus is able to string them, free them from self-righteousness, free them from the love of money, so that they become so small that they can enter into the kingdom of God through Jesus' narrow door. Jesus never promised you that he will make the door so big that everyone can walk through. Jesus always talked about the narrow way, the narrow door, and asked you to strive to go into it. You have to strive to enter into the narrow door. 
But that wonderful story, we have to wait until next week. That wonderful story about Jesus and the chief tax collector, the guy who is really big with money. But here, they were marveled. Who can be saved? Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And then came Peter. Peter is always very interesting at a time like that. When Jesus said, it's only possible with God, Peter jumped in and said, see, we have left our homes and follow you. Peter did not want Jesus to doubt that commitment, you see. It sounds like Jesus is questioning. Jesus obviously had questioned the young rich ruler. Now Jesus is questioning other people who have not given everything to follow him. And Peter immediately, wait, wait, um, master, just for your information, we have left everything to follow you. God has made us string to an end. See, we are the living proof. Jesus, Peter does not, did not want Jesus to doubt their commitment. We have left our homes and follow you. True or not? True or not? Truth outwardly. Wrong inwardly. It is a spiritual illusion. And Jesus knew that. Peter and the disciples' motive for leaving their homes and following Jesus had nothing to do with treasure in heaven, but have everything to do with treasure on earth. You understand? Why did they follow Jesus? Because they figured Jesus is going to become king in Jerusalem. And they figured that when Jesus became king, they will become rich and famous. Have they left their homes? Yes, they have. Have they followed Jesus physically? Yes, they have. Were they doing it for treasure in heaven? No. What were they doing it for? The treasure on earth. Jesus knew it. But the day will come. The day will come. The day will come when everything will change. Jesus will change this power-hungry disciple into someone who delighted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The light will come. The day will come. When that glorious light of the cross will shine upon the disciple, and Peter and the disciple, they will be transformed utterly by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Read the rest of the New Testament. Read the rest of the New Testament, and you will know Peter became a changed man. Peter would turn, truly turn from a camel to an end. Peter's eyes will be open to the spiritual reality of another world, of the kingdom. Peter's heart will be burning no longer for the treasure of this world. Peter will be burning for the treasures of another world. They become true heavenly pilgrim. They will forsake this world. They will submit themselves to the will of God. They will be journeying towards eternity, the city that will never die. And to these future pilgrims, not at that time, at that time they have no idea what's going to happen. To the future pilgrim, Jesus gave the following promises. So Jesus said to these future pilgrims, he said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife, or brothers, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. Now remember, at this time, the disciples have no true understanding of all these things. They probably read it wrongly. They probably read it that Jesus said, when I get to Jerusalem, you guys all will become rich and famous. You see, that's probably what they are thinking. But that's not what Jesus is thinking. Peter had asked this thing. Peter said, see, we have left our homes. So Jesus answered him about their homes. Jesus said, whoever have left house, wife, brothers, parents, children, what are these things? These are the things within the homes. In an ancient home, what constitutes a home? House and wife, brothers, parents, children. So what Jesus is saying is responding to Peter. Jesus said, for those who have left their earthly homes, I will provide them with a fuller, a warmer home and family. I will promise them of a richer and more abundant life in this world. And then... In the age to come, eternal lives. The phrase eternal life appears only three times 
in the Gospel of Luke. Two times in Luke chapter 18. It's an inclusive. Luke chapter 18, the man, the ruler, walk up to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And here, Jesus tells you a summary of the secret to attain eternal life. What must you do to receive eternal life? You let everything for the sake of the kingdom follow Jesus, not for a moment in life, but for a lifetime, then you will have eternal life. Leave for me. Leave everything for the sake of the kingdom. Leave everything for heavenly treasure. Leave everything for Jesus Christ. Then you will have eternal life. But we know that the disciples were not leaving that for Jesus at that time. But interestingly, the disciples were not the first one to leave behind everything. They were not the first one to have to submit themselves to God to attain eternal life. While the disciples are still rebelling against God in unbelief, while they were still loving the world and seeking wealth and power and not Jesus, there was another pilgrim in the story. There, within the story, there are two groups of people walking right by each other. One group seeking the treasure on earth, the other one seeking God's kingdom. While they were moving this way, there was another pilgrim, a kingdom heavyweight traveled in exact opposite direction. That heavyweight, he forsook all that he had. He submitted himself utterly to the will of the Father so that he may attain eternal life, not just for himself, but for many others, who is that kingdom heavyweight? He was none other than Jesus himself. Jesus never asked us to do anything that he would not himself do first. He asked us to forsake everything. He himself forsake everything for us. And that gospel message will come in the next three verses. We didn't read that, but it's there. There's a story of contrast. While well, the disciple refused to follow Jesus, Jesus himself was giving up his life for them. Verse 31, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. Everything about the Son of Man will be accomplished. What is that everything? What things? These things. The Son of Man will be delivered over to Gentiles. Mark and spit upon and after flogging him they will kill him and on the third day he will rise everything about the son of man will be accomplished in jerusalem not the fact that he will become an earthly king but the fact that he will be crucified on the cross so that our sins could be redeemed so that there will be a path open to heaven so that we may have treasures in heaven so that we may have eternal life. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the path to eternal life. No one can open the path to eternal life but Jesus himself. Will you come and follow Jesus? I pray that you will come. Forsake all that is in this world. Seek everything in another world. Follow Jesus and he will take you to that eternal life. Let's pray. So sometimes your word makes us feel like we have to preach like a madman. We have to preach like about things that's beyond this world. Who can understand these things? Even today, Christianity has become so much the thing of this world. Come to believe in Jesus. Because he can heal your sickness. Come and believe in the Lord Jesus because he can solve your financial trouble. He can solve your family problem. He will get you a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a wife, a husband, anything you want. He is able and he is loving. Just pray to him and he will grant you the desire of your heart. Rubbish, heresy, ignorance. We're so thankful that the real Jesus is not like that. That he gave us heart-wrenching warnings. He talked the talk, 
and he walked the walk. He asked us to forsake this world, and he showed us how he himself will forsake this world, so that we may have eternal life. Christmas is here. He has come, not to become a pretty baby, but to become for us the crucified Savior and Lord on the cross. Will we listen? Will we still see him as a good teacher, not knowing that he is the good God who has come to become the good Savior? I pray that you will open our eyes this Christmas. I pray that you will open our hearts this Christmas. I pray that we will seek after treasures in heaven and not on earth. Turn our eyes upon Jesus, high up in heaven, and we pray all that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.